Greetings, brethren. It's a privilege to be able to speak to you on this day of the Feast of Trumpets. As most of you know, the Church of God is not the only church that observes the Feast of Trumpets or the biblical holy days. The Orthodox Jews and also Messianic Jews observe the Feast of Trumpets and the biblical holy days. And yet they have very different ideas about what the Feast of Trumpets means and also very different things that they do on the Feast of Trumpets. Some within the Seventh-day Adventist community also have begun to keep the holy days, including the Feast of Trumpets. Part of this appears to be due to the influence of uh, the late Dr. Samuel Bakioki, who wrote several books about the holy days. I think it's interesting he wrote those books after coming in contact with the Church of God. Most mainstream Protestant religious groups do not observe the Holy Days or the Feast of Trumpets, and yet they've retained some of the ideas that are associated with the Feast of Trumpets about the return of Jesus Christ to this earth, taking up of believers into heaven, as we will see in the Scriptures, But they've altered the context of some of the scriptures that talk about these events to give a very different meaning to those scriptures. What I would like to do in the sermon today on the Feast of Trumpets is to discuss in a comparative way, looking at how different people view the Feast of Trumpets and some of the different ideas that people have about the Feast of Trumpets. But I want to look at these scriptures or look at these ideas in the light of the scriptures and notice what the Bible actually says and what it doesn't say. And I also want to review what the church of God has taught for decades and what the living church of God teaches about the feast of trumpets. My goal, my hope is during the sermon is that as we look at a comparative view of how different people look at the Feast of Trumpets, that we will all come to appreciate in a much deeper, more profound way the truth that God has revealed and preserved through his church. I've entitled the sermon, Different Views of the Feast of Trumpets. As we begin, I'd like to ask several questions to get you to think about what it is that we're talking about. Why do the Jews... Orthodox Jews and also Messianic Jews and the Church of God and others observe the Feast of Trumpets and the Biblical Holy Days. Basically, we observe these Holy Days and the Feast of Trumpets because God commands us to do that in the Scriptures. God revealed the Holy Days to his chosen people, the Israelites. That is, all the children of Israel, not just the Jews, but the holy days were given to the children of Israel, all 12 tribes of Israel. And God commanded them to remember these days and to observe these days for very special reasons. If we turn back to Exodus, the 19th chapter, we pick up the story where the Israelites had come out of Egypt. They had come before the mountain of Sinai, and God revealed to Moses what he wanted to do with these children of Israel. He wanted to make a covenant with them. A covenant is an agreement between two people that God says, I will do this if you will do that. And the other part of the covenant is, if you don't do that, then I will do this. A covenant is a legal agreement, and he wanted to make that legal agreement with the children of Israel. In chapter 19 of the book of Exodus, verses 5 and 6, he says, Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for the earth is mine. In other words, if you obey my commandments, you're going to be a special people to me. I've got a special mission for you, a special role for you to play. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. You know, priests are teachers who teach God's way of life to others. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
a very special nation, a special group of people. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel, not just to the Jews, but to the children of Israel. You'll notice as we turn through these pages in Exodus chapter 23 that the biblical holy days were part of this covenant. It mentions three times a year you're to take a pilgrimage up to Jerusalem during the spring holy days, during Pentecost, and then during the fall holy days. This was the agreement, the covenant that God wanted to make with ancient Israel. Now, the Israelites didn't follow that covenant. They didn't stay true to that covenant. They strayed. They forgot what God told them to do, and they went off and worshiped idols. And as a result, they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. We pick up the story next in Deuteronomy chapter 4. This is after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness when that generation that God had made a covenant with had died out. And we have God renewing this covenant, the same covenant, with the children of Israel, the children of the people that came out of Egypt, with another generation. So he's renewing virtually the same covenant. But Deuteronomy chapter 4 gives us a context for this covenant that God wanted to use the Israelites as a special people to set an example for the world to be a light and an example of God's way of life to the world. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and judgments, which I teach you to observe, that you may live, that your lives will go better, that things will go better for you, and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God of your fathers is giving to you. Don't add to the word that I command you, and don't take away. Just, Just keep the commandments is all that he was asking. Down in verse 6, he says, Therefore be careful to observe them, that is, these statutes and judgments, these instructions. For this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the peoples. This is going to set you apart from the other nations of of the world. This will be your understanding and your wisdom in the sight of the peoples. They will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. God was giving the children of Israel guidelines of how to live, guidelines about religion, guidelines about true ways of living that lead to happiness and peace. God wanted people to say, once they came in contact with the Israelites and saw their way of life, much like the queen of um, Sheba did when she came up and met Solomon and saw the peace and the joy in his kingdom. In verse 7, this was the response that God was hoping to see from other nations. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is near to us? For whatever reason we may call on him. We can call on God for whatever reason that we want. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I have set before you? And then Moses was told to tell the Israelites, take heed, diligently teach these things to your children and don't forget these statutes and these covenants, these statutes and judgments which were part of the covenant. So God gave the Israelites a set of values, a way of life. He gave them the biblical holy days to keep them mindful of a plan that God was working out on this earth. The holy days were part of this renewed covenant. You read that in Deuteronomy chapter 16, where the same holy days that were mentioned in Exodus chapter 23 are mentioned again. Deuteronomy chapter 28 describes what are called blessings and cursings. Now, these were the legal aspects of the covenant that God made with the Israelites. And basically, it says, if you obey me, you're going to be blessed. But if you forget my laws and you disobey me, then there will be severe consequences. And this was part of the covenant that God made, first of all, with the ancient Israelites, and then secondly, renewing that covenant with their children. It's the same covenant that runs through. In Leviticus chapter 23, 
we find the most complete listing of the biblical holy days. In what we find in Exodus 23 and also in Deuteronomy 16, it merely talks about the three times of year, the three um, pilgrimage feasts that were to be kept. But there are actually seven holy days, seven holy day periods, seven festivals. In Leviticus 23, we find a, a rather complete listing of these feasts. In verse 2, it says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord. Now, it doesn't say the feasts of Moses. It doesn't say the feasts of the Jews. It says the feasts of the Lord. And when we understand that Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament, these are the festivals that one that became Jesus Christ outlined for his people. And the Sabbath is part of that. It says these are, you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feasts. Whenever I went to college a number of years ago, it was a Presbyterian school, and we had a convocation every Wednesday morning. The word convocation means a commanded assembly. You have to be there. We filed in, and we had assigned seats in that convocation. And an upperclassman was up there, and he noticed where an empty seat was, and that was where perhaps my name should have been or where I should have been. And if we were absent, we were allowed three cuts a semester, three absences a semester. And after that, they began to lower our academic grades by a letter. In other words, we had to be there. It was a convocation. It was a commanded assembly. And what God is saying here to Moses is that these feasts are holy convocations. They are commanded assemblies. We're to be there, to be reminded of the meaning of these days. You can read down through the chapter and you'll find out that God says that these are statutes forever. They're to be kept forever and ever and ever. You can go to Zechariah chapter 14 and it mentions the people that don't come up to keep the feast in the coming kingdom of God will not get any rain in the next year. And if they don't come up the year after that, then other things are going to happen. God is going to point people and encourage people gently but then uh, with more uh, uh, encouragement to keep these feasts. They're not something we just decide to do if we want to or if we think we might. No, God says, I want you to keep them. They're part of my system. They're to keep you on target. But what's interesting is, what does the Feast of Trumpets mean? How do we know what it means? Why do the Jews have different views of the feast and do different things than the church of God? Well, part of it has to do with what is revealed and what is not revealed in the Old Testament. In Leviticus chapter 23, looking at verses 23, 24, and 25, we only have three verses that explain about the feast of trumpets. And when we look at it closely, we find out there's not a lot of information there. In verse 23, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, so the first, of the seventh, first day of the seventh month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So you have a holy convocation on the first day of the seventh month, you blow trumpets. It doesn't say anything else about the meaning. You shall do no customary work, so you don't work on that Sabbath. You offer an offering made by fire. Now, when Christ came, uh, he was the offering. We don't need to offer offerings anymore after that. But that is essentially the instruction that we find for observing the Feast of Trumpets. Very limited information. You can go to some other scriptures uh, very quickly. You could go to Numbers 10. We're not going to do that today. But Numbers 10 describes what trumpets were used for. So if you're blowing a trumpet on the Feast of Trumpets, it must fall into one of these categories. The trumpets were blown to assemble people. So when you want to call a meeting, you blow a trumpet. If you want to warn your people that there's danger coming, you blow a trumpet. If you want to uh, attack someone, go to war, you blow a trumpet. Uh, <clears throat> or 
trumpets were to be blown on holy days. But still, it doesn't give you a lot of information about the meaning of the holy days. One of the reasons that the Jews have different uh, practices and different beliefs about the meaning of the Feast of Trumpets is that they don't use the New Testament, which gives us a perspective that is missing from the Old Testament, gives us details that are just not in the Old Testament. In Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, you can turn there at a later time. But this is describing what the Jews did when they returned from the Babylonian captivity back to Jerusalem. They began keeping the biblical holy days, including the Feast of Trumpets. Why did they do that? Why did they start keeping the biblical holy days when they came back from captivity? You'll find that described in Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel was given a series of prophecies and warnings to deliver to the children of Israel. However, he was among the Babylonian captives around 500 B.C. in Babylon. But he told the elders of Israel, the reason you're in captivity is you have defiled my Sabbaths. You've defiled my holy days. You've gone off and worshipped idols. And they had that to chew on for 70 years in Babylon. And when the Jews came back to Jerusalem, they had learned this lesson that they went into captivity because they defiled God's Sabbaths. And that's why they added a lot of other restrictions to the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath. That's why they keep the biblical holy days because they were told when they were in captivity, you're here because you defiled my Sabbaths and my holy days. And the Jews have never forgotten that. That's why they keep the biblical holy days. But as I mentioned, there's not a lot of instructions in the Old Testament that explain the meaning of the Feast of Trumpets. I'd like to look at why the Jews keep the Feast of Trumpets, what they believe. Now, some might say, well, why should we be concerned about what the Jews do on the Feast of Trumpets? Well, I have seen over the years that a number of people, not only in the Church of God, but in other religious organizations, have kind of a feeling, well, if the Jews keep the biblical holy days and they're following the Bible, they must understand some things that we don't understand. So if we look at what they do, maybe we could learn some things and learn what they do and why they do it. What's interesting is that because the Old Testament doesn't say much about the Feast of Tabernacles, that leaves human beings kind of on their own to look around and see if they can come up with what that, that day means. And the rabbis did this in years past. They looked through the scriptures, basically the Old Testament scriptures, to find out what happened whenever trumpets were blown. And this might give them an idea of what the Feast of Trumpets is all about. And they can go to, or they, they went to Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 19, just a little bit later in the chapter that we were reading a little bit ago. And it mentions whenever God gave the law to Moses on Sinai, there were lightnings, there were thunderings, there was an earthquake, and a trumpet was blown. And this is one of the few places in the Bible where God apparently blew the trumpet. And the Jews make this association that a trumpet was blown when the law was given to Moses on Sinai. They also went to uh, Genesis chapter 22. And this is the account of whenever Abraham was instructed to offer his son to God as a sacrifice. He bound up Isaac, placed him on the altar. And when God saw that Abraham's heart was to obey him, he said, look over there in the bushes. There's a ram caught in the bushes. Use the ram for the sacrifice. And one of the trumpets that was blown in the Old Testament was a shofar, which was made out of a ram's horn. So the Jews make this connection between a sacrificial ram that was offered in place of Isaac and because the ram had a horn that they can make a shofar out of it that they read Genesis 22 on the Feast of Trumpets. In a way, it does tie into the meaning of that day because the, the ram was a substitutional sacrifice and Jesus Christ came to die for us as a sacrifice for our sins. So there is a tie in there. 
but you have to have the New Testament to make it fully meaningful. One other scripture that the rabbis looked at was in Joshua chapter 6, where the Israelites marched around Jericho and then blew trumpets and the walls fell down. It was a time of judgment in that sense uh, on the uh, people of Jericho. So these are some of the the reasons why the Jews read certain scriptures on the Feast of Trumpets. They're looking at the past. They're looking back. They're looking uh, at history to try and understand what the day means. In many Jewish encyclopedias and books about the uh, holy days as far as the way the Jews keep them, the Feast of Trumpets is usually referred to as Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. It's not a biblical name. It's a name that comes from the Jewish Torah, a commentary on the scriptures, some of which go back to Babylon. The word Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year or the beginning of the year. It's called the Jewish New Year. Again, it's interesting that the Jewish civil calendar begins uh, in the fall with the Jewish New Year on the Feast of Trumpets, and yet God's holy days begin in the spring. And some people ask, well, why do they begin in the fall for the Jews on the Jewish New Year on trumpets? And many sources will tell you that that was when the Babylonians began to observe their New Year. And it appears that the Jews picked up this Babylonian custom while they were in captivity. So it's not a biblical teaching. It's not a biblical custom. It came from their time uh, when they were exposed to the Babylonian calendar. So it's a tradition that they maintain, but it's not a biblical tradition. A number of other traditions, very quickly, just to look at that the Jews observe on the Feast of Trumpets. They observe what are called the Ten Days of Judgment or the Ten Days of Awe or Days of Awe that begin at the Feast of Trumpets and end on the, first, on the, on the Day of Atonement. This is a period of, of self-examination where they are to look inwardly, examine themselves, uh, read certain prayers, do certain good deeds, uh, basically to to justify themselves before God. The tradition is in the Jewish faith, the Orthodox Jewish faith, that in heaven, books are opened on the Feast of Trumpets. Books are open. And names are recorded in those books. If you've been a good person for the, la the past year, then your name will be put in, in the, or inscribed in the Book of the Righteous. If you've been a bad person, your name will be written in a book for wicked people. If God's not sure where you belong, then he'll leave you alone for about 10 days to see what you're going to do during these days of judgment or days of awe. In a way, when you look at this, it's a way of kind of uh, justifying yourself with God. If you pray enough, if you do enough good deeds, and if you apologize to people that you've offended, then hopefully you'll get your name written in the right book and not written in the wrong book. Again, there's no biblical instruction that this actually takes place on trumpets, but it is a tradition. Uh, many Orthodox Jews and some uh, apparently uh, Messianic Jews will also eat fruit or bread that is dipped in honey during the Feast of Trumpets. And the idea is that uh, bread or fruit dipped in honey or really sweet fruit eaten on the three Feast of Trumpets is kind of symbolic of hoping that the coming year will be a sweet year a good year. Many of the Jews will also greet other Jews by saying, may you be inscribed, basically meaning in the book of life, uh, for a good year. Again, it's a tradition. There's no biblical uh, indication that this actually happens or will happen on the Feast of Trumpets, but it's a tradition. Another tradition is that they may stand beside a, a stream or uh, beside a lake or, or a river or the ocean and throw breadcrumbs into the river, into that body of water. And that's supposedly symbolic of God casting away your sins or that they are symbolically casting away their sins. Again, there's no biblical instruction to do these things. These are traditions that have developed over the years. This tradition of, of throwing uh, <clears throat> breadcrumbs into a body of water appears to have developed around the 15th century sometimes. So it's not something that comes from the scriptures. It's interesting too is to 
why they blow trumpets on the Feast of Trumpets. Now, the Bible says to do it, but according to one rabbi, he made this statement. He says, the reason that we blow trumpets is to confuse Satan. Because when these books are open and names are being inscribed in the books, that Satan will show up and begin accusing people. But if there's a lot of trumpet noise, he's going to get confused. And he's not going to be able to accuse the right people of the right things. Uh, again, this is a tradition that people follow. Uh, but it's not something that we find in the scriptures. It is kind of interesting whenever you look at all the traditions that are associated with how some of the Jews keep the Feast of Trumpets. It's interesting to note Paul's comment in Titus chapter 1. Now, what Paul is writing about to uh, New Testament Christians, he's talking about be careful of people that come with different ideas that are not found in the Scriptures. Notice in verse 10 of chapter 1 of Titus. It says, for many, for there are many insubordinate and idle talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Again, these were uh, Jewish Christians or people coming into the Christian faith with a strong Jewish background who brought a lot of traditions with them. But he says, be careful. Uh, the, the mouths of these people must be stopped because they subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. In verse 14, Paul warns Christians, he says, don't give heed to Jewish fables. Now, we have some people that want to look, well, how did the Jews do this and how did they do that? And they're following the Bible, so maybe we should follow them. But Paul makes this comment very clear. He says, don't give heed to Jewish fables, Jewish traditions, and the commandments or teachings of men who turn from the truth, who don't follow the Bible, but have picked up a lot of traditions. We'll come back to this in just a little bit. So the Jews have a lot of traditions, especially Orthodox Jews, that are associated with the Feast of Trumpets, but they don't come from the Bible. Some come from Babylon. Some come from other traditions, even down through the Middle Ages. What about Messianic Jews? These are Jews who believe in Jesus Christ, who accept the New Testament. What do they believe, and how do they observe the Feast of Trumpets? Essentially, they recognize that the biblical holy days picture major steps in the plan of God. They recognize that the spring holy days, Passover, Days of Unleavened Bread, and then Pentecost, are memorials of events that have already taken place, historical events that have taken place in the past. Jesus Christ, the Passover, who gave his life for our sins. Passover is a memorial of that. Days of Unleavened Bread. Now, they don't understand all the aspects of this, but essentially they understand that uh, Days of Unleavened Bread picture putting sin out of our lives. Pentecost pictures the New Testament church and also the outpouring of God's Spirit that enables us to grow and overcome. But they also recognize, Messianic Jews, most of them recognize that the fall holy days picture prophetic events events that are going to be taking place in the future that depict major events, major steps in the plan of God. And for many of them, the Feast of Trumpets pictures a time of judgment, which we'll see is pretty much on target. It's a time for gathering the saints together to God, which, again, is pointing in the right direction. But it's interesting, uh, some of the books that I have here, one entitled The Feasts of the Lord. The Feasts of the Lord. The authors are Kevin Howard and Marvin Rosenthal. Uh, they're Messianic Jews. They make the statement in their book. It's interesting. He says that the following the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 A.D., that the observance of the Feast of Trumpets was radically altered in other words, once the temple was destroyed and the priesthood uh, basically dispersed, he says the observance of the Feast of Trumpets was radically altered. The liturgy, litur the liturgy was enlarged and many new traditions were added. In other words, many new traditions were added. Uh, and where God says, remember we read in Deuteronomy chapter 4, don't add, don't take away, just do what I've asked you to do. Howard and Rosenthal also make the comment that the new year, the Jewish new year, gradually overshadowed the Feast of Trumpets. 
In other words, the, the traditions of the Jewish New Year, eating sweet breads and eat, eating sweet fruits and greeting each other, may you be inscribed and throwing uh, breadcrumbs in the water, things like that, the books being inscribed. Uh, many of these traditions were added and overshadowed the real meaning of the Feast of Trumpets. But again, as we mentioned, the Old Testament doesn't give us the full meaning of the Feast of Trumpets. We really need another dimension, and that dimension is found in the New Testament. The Jewish New Year, as I mentioned already, came from Babylon and not from the Bible. Casting sins into water comes from the 15th century. Again, not from the time of Jesus Christ. And as we will see, the books that are going to be opened when Christ returns are opened at that time and not every year. You know, some of them believe that if you have your name written in the wrong book during the Feast of Trumpets, that you'll die in the coming year. But these are traditions. These are not what we find in the scriptures. Another book uh, dealing with the same topic entitled The Messiah and the Feast of Israel, written by Sam Nadler. He makes the observation, as do other Messianic Jews, that the Feast of Trumpets pictures a time of fiery judgment when the Messiah returns, which is exactly what the Bible says. But then he goes on and says it pictures also the rapture of the church, when millions of people are going to disappear, float up into the clouds. And, you know, if a pilot happened to be a Christian and he's uh, raptured away, then the, pilot, uh, the, the plane is going to crash and all these people are going to die. If the bus driver of a bus happens to be a, a Christian who's raptured away, then the bus crashes because the driver was removed. Now, where do these ideas come from? Is this actually what the Bible says? You know, they will use, and many other people will use, that believe in the rapture, uh, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll look at several verses there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> Now, Paul is writing <clears throat> uh, to the early New Testament church, and they were concerned about when Christ was going to return and what things were going to be like. In verse 13 of chapter 4, Paul says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those that have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. In other words, when Christ returns, he's going to bring those who have been resurrected. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the, day of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, there's going to be a resurrection when Christ returns. People are going to be changed. They're going to come with Jesus Christ back to the earth. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Now notice some of these things that are associated with the return of Jesus Christ. He's going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God. And with the trumpet of God. So there's going to be a resurrection, a shout, Christ returns, a trumpet is going to be blown. The dead in Christ will rise. Then those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, for some people, they look at this and say, this is going to be a rapture. People are just going to be taken away. They're going to meet God. They're going to go to heaven and spend forever with God in heaven. And yet the Bible says this is going to occur when Christ returns, when there's a, um, a shout that people will hear. There's going to be a resurrection. There'll be a trumpet blown. All these things are going to take place at once. And I think as we will see, to assume that this is going to take everybody off to heaven that believes in God could be millions and millions of people, uh, and then they're going to stay there until uh, the uh, tribulation is over is not really what the Bible says. Again, Mr. Nadler makes this comment. He says, the rapture of the church will occur Millions of people will disappear, and the last trump begins the seven-year tribulation. Now, think about that. Remember that for just a minute. The last trump begins the seven-year tribulation. This is the time of Jacob's trouble, a time of Jacob's trouble mentioned in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. But is this a rapture? 
Are people going to be taken to heaven and stay there for seven years? Is this really what the sequence of events pictures that we are keep and we, that we are to be mindful of on the Feast of Trumpets? What I'd like to do next is to look at what the Bible actually says. What is the sequence of events that is actually that is really recorded in the Bible, where God shows us what is going to happen? that really explains the meaning of the Feast of Trumpets. And once we understand the New Testament scriptures, this dimension that is missing largely from the Old Testament, a lot of scriptures begin to make sense. And you can't just take one scripture like in in 1 Thessalonians and take it out of context. When you put that in the proper context, it doesn't mean a rapture. It doesn't mean people are going to be floating off to heaven for years and years and years. What I'd like to do next is to look at uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation, where we find a sequence of events that God inspired, gave to uh, the apostle John. John recorded, and it's for our admonition, for our instruction. And we need to understand this sequence if we're going to understand the Feast of Trumpets properly. Notice in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, for several verses, gives a background and gives kind of an orientation. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now, things did begin to come to pass that uh, uh, the persecution of the church in the early centuries that's mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. So things began, but then the rest of the book of Revelation is really about the more distant future. Verse 3, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. The word in the Greek, blessed, means to be envied. In other words, you, you, you will be envied if you read and understand what this book is saying because you're going to have a handle on what's happening in the world. You're going to have a handle on and an understanding of God's plan and purpose, which those that don't read or don't understand this book of Revelation will not have. In verse 9, it says, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ was on the island, which is called Patmos, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And be, I hold, <clears throat> excuse me. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, "I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Uh, what you see, write in a book." Now, many theologians today and many Christians will read this verse, verse ten, and they say, "Well, this was John on on Sunday," and yet it says, "The Lord's day." This is the only place in the Bible where it says the Lord's day, but there are some 30 places in the Bible that talk about the day of the Lord, the Lord's day or the day of the Lord. And it's not described as a Sabbath service. It's not a joyful time. The scriptures that talk about the day of the Lord or the Lord's day, when you put it in context, it's a day of wrath, a day of thunder, a day of lightnings, a terrible period of time, a time of, of, of trial a time of suffering. This is what the Feast of Trumpets looks to in part. When these trumpets are going to be blown, the Lord's day, the time of the Lord's judgment is what it's talking about. You might want to look up some scriptures in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. It talks about the day of the Lord as being a time of judgment, a time of trial. Isaiah chapter 22, it's called a, verse 5, is called a day of trouble. The day of the Lord is a day of trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, this time of Jacob's trouble is called a great day. This time of Jacob's trouble, a great time of trouble. It's going to be the tribulation, really, what it's talking about. In Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it talks about the great day of the Lord, a day of wrath. So this is not Sunday. It's not a Sabbath day. It's a time when God intervenes in world affairs and shakes up this world. This is what the Feast of Trumpets is looking forward to. In Joel chapter 1 and chapter 2, it talks about blowing a trumpet on the day of the Lord, this time when God intervenes in history. This is what the Feast of Trumpets is looking forward to, a time when God intervenes in world affairs and literally shakes the world to its foundations. 
and a world that doesn't believe that God exists, a world that doesn't believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God is going to be sobered and realize that God is intervening, that he is alive and he's going to shake the world. So we're introduced to the subjects of the future, subjects about the future, prophecies of the future in the book of Revelation. In chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, John is invited up to heaven before the throne of God. And this is a vision that he had. And in chapter 5, <clears throat> he's shown a scroll that is wrapped with seven bindings or seven seals around that scroll. And he wonders what's in the scroll. And the Son of Man, or Jesus Christ, uh, is told that he can open the scroll. And then he begins to open the different seals, indicating that here's an insight into what's in the, in, the, in the scroll. As you open one seal, then another, then another. In Revelation chapter 6, the opening of the first seal is described. Actually, the first four seals refer to the four horsemen, uh, these symbolic riders on different colored horses that are talking about things coming in the future. And if you can, go, you can go back later and check uh, and read through Revela excuse me, Matthew chapter 24, and you'll find a parallel description of these events. The rider on the white horse has a bow and a crown, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And it's talking about false teachers. Uh, Satan is pictured in the Bible with a bow. Uh, Jesus Christ is pictured in prophecy with a sword, a very different instrument. But this is talking about false prophets, false teachers are going to get worse and worse and worse as we approach the end of the age. And it's going to be challenging to figure out what is the truth and what is not the truth. But this is all part of what is going to be happening in the future, pictured by the Feast of Trumpets. In verse 4, another horse, a fiery red horse, to take peace from the earth. It's talking about a time of violence and warfare that's going to come and spread around the world really impacting the entire world. Uh, the third seal is a rider on a black horse with a pair of scales indicating a time of famine that's coming. You know, it's interesting. We're watching uh, droughts developing in Australia, in the southwestern part of the United States, other parts of the world that are grain-growing regions. And if these things continue and our population continues to increase, then there's going to be a real scramble for resources, not just for oil, but for water and for food. And the Bible indicates this is what is coming. This is what is coming. The fourth seal, a rider on a pale horse, and talks about a lot of people are going to die. This is talking about disease epidemics and disasters that are going to strike the world. These are things that are going to be building up as we approach the end of the age. But those are the first four seals that are open. The fifth seal, it talks about a cry of the martyrs. This is talking about a time of martyrdom. And when you link this up with uh, Matthew chapter 24, it's talking about a time of, of tribulation, a time of persecution when believers are going to be persecuted for believing the truth of the Bible. You know, the Pope has basically said we need to be keeping Sunday. And yet the Bible says we're to be keeping the Sabbath. People that believe and actually try and follow what the Bible says are going to be persecuted. This happened in the Roman Empire. It happened under the Holy Roman Empire. And it's going to happen again when a beast and a false prophet get together. So this is the fifth seal. Now, notice where this is in the, uh, the sequence. This fifth seal is the tribulation. It's going to be a three and a half year period of suffering. This is going to be the time of Jacob's trouble. Whenever Satan launches an attack using a false prophet and a beast on the Israelite nations that were supposed to be lights and examples to the world, but turned their back on God. And this goes back then to Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26, the blessings and the cursings that God says, if you obey me, you're going to be blessed. But if you disobey, you forget, you go off in a different direction then you will face the music, you'll face the consequences. And that's what's going to happen during the tribulation. The tribulation is Satan's wrath poured out on God's people. But notice there's something else in verse 12. The heavenly signs, a great earthquake, the sun and the moon and the stars uh, 
are, are, are blackened out. And there's a news account recently of some things that happened uh, on one of the planets that uh, it looked like a, a shooting uh, gallery when a, a, an asteroid hit another planet. You know, things like that may happen in the future. We have movies about it today, Independence Day and some other things. What's going to happen on this Earth whenever you know, an asteroid looks like it's going to collide with us? Some of these things may happen. God is going to get the attention of the peoples of the world. But notice the tribulation, then these heavenly signs, then in chapter 7, it talks about the sealing uh, or protection of 144,000 people. Now, some people say that these are 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are going to be converting the Jews. But it doesn't say that. It talks about 144,000 drawn from the 12 tribes of Israel. Not the Jews, but the Israelites. Now, this may be symbolic. There could be a lot of discussion about actually who is going to make up this 144,000. All I want to say right now is there's a sudden break here in the sequence of events. 144,000 are going to be sealed or protected. And again, not protected from the tribulation. Not protected from the tribulation. That's already occurred before these heavenly signs. They're going to be protected from the day of the Lord. When God pours out his wrath and shakes the world, that's what they're being protected from or sealed from. You notice the last verse here of chapter 6 that follows the description of the uh, cosmic signs or the heavenly signs. Uh, as these heavenly signs appear in verse 17, then it says, for the great day of his wrath has come. Or in other words, it's come time now for the great day of God's wrath. And who is able to stand? And then right after that, uh, these uh, saints are going to be sealed, 144,000 protected from God's wrath that is coming. Then we come to chapter 8 in this sequence of events. In chapter 8 of the book of Revelation, it talks about the seventh seal is open. So this is the last seal binding thing around this scroll. The last one is open, and then it mentions seven trumpets were blown. So here's where trumpets come into the picture. Not until after the tribulation, after the heavenly signs, then comes the seventh seal, and it's made up of seven trumpets that begin to blow. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these things, but each one of these trumpets that are blown have incredible impact. The seas turn to blood, things die, uh, uh, a third of the sun and the moon were, were darkened, uh, locusts from bottomless pit and so on. All these things take place in this last, what appears to be a year. It talks about the day of the Lord, and in Numbers 14, chapter 14, verse 34, it talks about a day is like a year. Uh, so the day of the Lord principle, the day for a year principle is found there. When it talks about the day of the Lord, it appears to be the last uh, year of this three and a half year tribulation so it appears to be about a year's time when these things begin to happen but notice then in verse in uh, chapter 11 we're jumping over towards the end of this discussion six trumpets have blown and we get to chapter 11 the seventh trumpet is blown the last of the seven trumpets is blown and notice what happens what the bible says is going to happen when the last trumpet is blown Verse 15 of Revelation chapter 11. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, loud voices, shouts, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God in their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped him, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is who is and was and is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry. Your wrath, the day of your wrath has come. Judgment. And the time of the dead when they should be judged. So here's the, the, the judging of the dead, the resurrection of the dead at a time at, uh, whenever Christ returns in power. And you should reward your servants, the prophets. What's that reward going to be? It's going to be eternal life. It's going to be a crown to reign with Jesus Christ, to become spirit beings, to become part of God's government in the coming kingdom of God. This all happens 
when the seventh trumpet is blown, not before, not before the tribulation, but at the last trump. And those who fear you, small and great, and you will destroy those who destroy the earth. So this is the sequence that the Bible reveals. These four horsemen, these signs begin developing and uh, become uh, worldwide in scope. Then the tribulation begins. Then the heavenly signs. Then these seven trumpets are blown to take about a year. And on the last trump, Jesus Christ returns. There's a resurrection. Uh, the saints are made spirit beings, and the reward is given to the saints. Now, why is that important? You may say, well, I know all these things, but why is this important? Basically, because many people have different views and different teachings about a different sequence. Remember, we talked about the idea that uh, the Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, that this means a rapture, people going off and spending seven years in heaven. Well, there was a trumpet blown there. There were people being resurrected there. And the only place the Bible talks about that's going to happen is at the last trump when Christ returns. Let's look next at several scriptures that um, don't fit with this idea that there's going to be a rapture, people go off to heaven, and then the tribulation begins. In Matthew chapter 24, it talks about false Christ. It talks about uh, wars and rumors of wars, famines, disease, epidemics, and so on. Basically the same thing that is talked about in Revelation chapter 6 with the four horsemen. In verse 9, it says, Then, after these things that are talked about that the four horsemen will do, they will deliver you... It's talking about the church, could also be talking about the Israelite peoples, the peoples of God. They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. You know, the Americans are being blamed for this economic downturn, this economic crisis that has hit the world. You know, it was the mortgages and things like that that developed here in the United States that uh, stimulated part of this. Now, other people were involved around the world. But when you get outside the U.S., they're blaming us for this. They're blaming people in America. They're blaming Americans for the problems in Iraq. They're blaming Americans for the problems in Afghanistan. And we have yet to see what's going to happen in other parts of the Middle East. But the Bible says you're going to be hated by all nations. And they're going to feel justified in coming at us in whatever way that they're going to do that. It says many will be offended and so on. Many false prophets will arise. But let's jump down to verse 29 to get back to this sequence because some people feel that there's going to be a rapture, people taken off to heaven, uh, Christ is going to come back and get them taken back to heaven. But the Bible only talks about one time when Christ is going to come back, not several times. In verse 29, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. These are the heavenly signs. So this is the same sequence that we find in the book of Revelation. After the tribulation, there will be these heavenly signs. Then in verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man. Now, this is after the tribulation. This is after the heavenly signs. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. See, it's going to be a day of terror when Christ returns. People are going to be scared out of their wits. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the, clou in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He's not going to sneak up on people and grab off a pilot out of a plane and sneak up on people and grab the bus driver. It says he is coming back with power and great glory, and people are going to see all of this, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. When is that trumpet going to be sounded that Christ is going to return? At the last trump, at the very end of this sequence, and he will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the heaven to the other. Now, First Thessalonians talks about gathering the saints together, but it's at a time when there's going to be a resurrection, a time when a trumpet is going to be blown, a time when the saints are going to be changed. So the Bible tells us Christ's return is going to be after the tribulation, not before it, and after the heavenly signs. Let's go now to First um, Thessalonians. <clears throat> 
Just to look at that again very quickly by way of review. And notice the elements that are described here. <clears throat> There's going to be a resurrection. That's mentioned in verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive when Christ returns and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. They've got to be resurrected first. Then the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And again, there was shouting in heaven whenever Christ was preparing to return. Uh, and the trumpet of God is going to sound, and the dead in Christ will raise, and then others will be caught up to uh, gather with him in the clouds. Now, what's going to happen, and when is it going to happen? Some say this is before the tribulation, but the Bible doesn't indicate that. Let's go now to 1 Corinthians. Now, keep in mind, Thessalonians was written probably a decade or so before Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. And he was addressing the question, when is Christ going to return? What is it going to be like? That's the question he was addressing in 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's talking about the resurrection again. That's the context of the chapter. When is this resurrection going to occur? Notice his answer. In verse 51, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall be changed. He's talking about believers, a time when we're going to inherit eternal life. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now, the last trump is the seventh trump that we talked about. That's when Christ is going to return. That's when this resurrection is going to take place. That's when the change from physical to spiritual, when we inherit eternal life, is going to take place. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. And all of this is going to take place at the last trumpet, and we shall be changed. So this is what the Bible has to reveal about this last trump. Let's go back again to Revelation chapter 11. This description of what's going to happen on the last trumpet, when the last of the seven trumpets is blown, Verse 15, Revelation chapter 11, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. He's coming back to take over. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat on there fell down and worshiped God. Uh, and it mentions that he's going to take his great power and reign. He was angry. He's going to reward his saints uh, and the prophets. So this is the sequence that we find in the scriptures. That Christ is not going to return until after the tribulation. He's not going to return until after the heavenly signs. And he's not going to return until the seventh trumpet. And this idea of being raptured off to heaven uh, and spending heaven or time in heaven during the tribulation doesn't really fit with the scriptures. And we have to ask another question. Is God going to allow uh, his saints to go through the tribulation? If we go to Revelation chapter 3 we find that true believers are going to be protected during the tribulation. This is a promise that is made to the Philadelphia era of the church. And that era appears to have begun with the ministry of Mr. Armstrong in the 20s and 30s. And it appears to have ended about the time of his death. And we appear to be living in what is called the Laodicean era of the church, the very last age of the church just before Jesus Christ returns. The description of the Philadelphia church mentions in verse 8, I know your works. I set before you an open door. Nobody can shut it. You have little strength. For you've kept my word and you've not denied my name. You have continued to do what I told you to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Uh, you proclaim the truth. Talk about the coming kingdom of God. Warn the world about what's going to happen. You know, we have an internet to use today that Mr. Armstrong didn't have, the apostles didn't have. With uh, a fraction of the effort, our message can go the whole way around the world. Some people think the work has been finished, the work is over. And yet that doesn't fit with what God's described uh, in Matthew chapter 10, about verse 22 and 23 where it says, you will not have gone over all the cities of Israel before the uh, return of Jesus Christ. So we have a work to do, a job to do. 
In verse 10, it says, because you have kept my command to persevere, because you have continued to preach the gospel and warn the world, you didn't give up. You didn't stop when everybody else was saying the work is over. I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. This is talking about the tribulation. And it's talking about protection during that period of time. Now, that same promise is not repeated to the Laodicean church, the church at the end of the age. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. You better be zealous and repent. You know, you're lukewarm in what you're doing. If we turn quickly to Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, the implication is all of God's people are not going to be protected during the tribulation. Some are going to have to go through the tribulation. They're not going to be protected from it. In verse 14, it says to the woman, it's talking about the church was given two wings of a great eagle that she may fly into the wilderness to her place. It's talking about a place on this earth where they're going to be protected, a place of safety, where she is nourished for a time, time and half a time, three and a half years from the presence of the serpent, protected from the efforts of Satan to get at the church. And the Satan spewed water, this is talking about large numbers of people, out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman. It's not talking about clouds helping uh, people. It's talking about the earth. Some place on this earth is going to be a place of safety, a place of protection. You're not being raptured off into heaven, but some place on this earth, God is going to protect his people. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood. Uh, these armies or the uh, people of the dragon. But notice in verse 17, and the, the dragon was enraged with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring that were not protected, the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments. Now, you may keep the holy days. You may keep the Sabbath. You may follow the dietary laws. You may believe in a lot of things. But if you're not actively involved in doing the work of God, if you're not growing as a Christian, then you may have this to look forward to. And it's very sobering. Satan is going to go after those who keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus Christ who were not protected in a place of safety. So these are things that we need to be mindful of as we observe the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets pictures a time when Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth. Not everyone who's looking forward to that return is going to be protected. We saw that in Revelation 3 and Revelation 12. If you'll turn to Matthew chapter 7, Jesus was talking about exactly the same thing. In the Sermon on the Mount at the very beginning of his ministry, again, he's looking ahead to the future. These are prophecies to help us understand what's coming so that we can be ready for these things. In verse 21 of Matthew chapter 7, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, boss, boss, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus said in John 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. That's the same thing God said to ancient Israel. I love you. I want you to be my special people. Keep my commandments. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't slip away. Don't let them slip away from you. But Jesus warned, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my father obeys my commandments. Many will say to me in that day, that day talking about when Christ returns, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Haven't we preached sermons in your name, prayed in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful things? And then Jesus' response is this. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. We were never on the same page. You know, I asked you to keep the Sabbath, and you were keeping Sunday. I asked you to keep the holy days, and you started keeping Christmas and Easter. I told you not to eat certain things, and you felt you were free to eat whatever you want. So it's a very different approach, a very different message. He says, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Many people today believe the laws of God have been done away with. We don't have to do those things. They're Jewish. And yet the 
covenant that God made was made with the nation of Israel. Twelve different tribes, not just with the Jews. These holy days are not just Jewish holy days. They are God's holy days. So we find from the scriptures that we better be careful about what we believe. Many people have many different ideas about the holy days, and many people have many different ideas about what the Feast of Trumpets means. They've taken certain scriptures out of context, and they've also introduced a lot of other traditions that are never even once mentioned in the scriptures. You might do a little study, and I'll leave you with this as an assignment. Who is going to be protected? What are the qualities that God is going to look for in people that he's going to protect during the tribulation? Qualities that are going to be needed in the coming kingdom of God. Let me give you several very quickly. In Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, God is going to be looking for qualities of character, people that are humble, people that are teachable, people that tremble at the word of God. Those qualities are described in Matthew chapter 5. In John chapter 15, we're commanded as Christians to love our neighbors. Can't be arguing with them, can't be gossiping about them, spreading rumors about them. We've got to understand what love is, and your closest neighbor is your spouse, your husband, your wife, your children, your parents, your grandparents, and the people next door. Do you show love? Do you know how to show love to your spouse, to your children, to your parents? God's going to be looking for those qualities. In Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, God said, Go through Israel and put a mark on the foreheads of those who sigh and cry. God, I see what's happening to our nation. I see what's happening to our people in, in the city in which I live. I see what's happening to my family. God, may your kingdom come soon. God wants to see people and notice people who have compassion, who care about the direction that the world is going and who want to turn that world around and want to play a role in the coming kingdom of God doing that. In Micah chapter 6, verse 8, God says, I'm going to be looking for people who do justly, who, who treat people with justice equally, who love mercy. They're not letter of the law persons. You've got to do it this way or you're going to get smashed. No, we've got to be understanding. We've got to be merciful. Yes, we've got to toe certain lines, but we can also be merciful. Who walk humbly before their God. God said it. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to argue with it. He obviously knows better than I do. Isaiah 66, verse 2, another quality, several qualities. People that are poor, they're humble, they're contrite, they're willing to repent. You know, sometimes it's hard to admit I'm wrong or I did something wrong. But, you know, there, there are two words that, that mean an awful lot. I'm sorry, I was wrong. I want to change. I want to grow. People that are humble, that are contrite, willing to repent, and that tremble at my word, not argue with my word, but tremble at my word. They read it in the scriptures and they want to do it. Matthew 24, it talks about watching, being alert, and not being deceived. And we've talked about a number of different ideas about the Feast of Trumpets, a number of different ideas about what to do and what the day means. And yet many of these things come from traditions. They come from scriptures that have been taken out of context. We have got to be careful and be alert that we're not deceived and misled into believing wrong things and following a totally out-of-sequence idea about what is going to happen. In Revelation chapter 3, we also read that God is going to be looking for people who are dedicated to doing the work of God, of preaching the gospel to the world, of warning this world, and that are focused on doing those things, not focused on, on a bunch of social activities, not focused on themselves, but willing to sacrifice, to do the work of God, to reach this world with a message of hope about the return of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> how he is going to come back. He does live. He's going to return. God's going to intervene on this earth. You know, the Feast of Trumpets is the middle holy day. You've got Passover, Days of Unleavened Bread and Pentecost before, and then afterwards you have atonement, you have the Feast of Tabernacles and the last great day. But the Feast of Trumpets is the pivot point 
It's the turning point when history is going to turn and go another direction, when Jesus Christ returns and intervenes on the face of this earth and brings peace to this earth. Brethren, this is why we are here on the Feast of Trumpets, is not looking backward, it's looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ, the establishing of God's government on this earth. And when God begins to intervene and show human beings that he's alive, he's well, and he's going to rule on this earth and bring peace to this earth, it's going to be a very exciting time. It's going to be a sobering time, a time of trial, a time of test, but it's also going to be a very rewarding time when the last trumpet sounds and Christ returns and the saints are changed to spirit beings. This is what the Feast of Trumpets is all about. It's a very exciting time, a sobering time. We are to keep the Feast of Trumpets to be reminded of these significant events.